Who's blessed already? Like, is this turning out to be a different retreat or what? In fact, I wasn't calling this a retreat. I just kept feeling the Holy Spirit was like, don't use the word retreat. It's not a retreat anymore. We've retreated for too long. This is a pastor's gathering. So we no longer, we no longer retreat. We gather so we can advance. Is that true? I think there's something that God is doing that is different. And I, I really, really am keen to just process with people. I'm, 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 I'm enjoying hearing what people are learning. Um, I, I had a really interesting, um, just con I've had different conversations with different ones of you. It's interesting when, um, was it Pastor B3 or Apmo who talked about the, the, the time when you hear something and your heart is telling you, this feels right, but your mind is telling you, no, this is too extreme. Yeah? yeah? It was you that said it. And you know, it's so, it's so interesting because as I, as I hear these words, I'm, I'm really, I mean, I was one of the ones who really struggled, but I, I hear some of the challenges we've had at Mavuno. And I'm like, this is, this is what was going on. This is what was going on. Um, yeah. Pastor Mike Onan, where are you? Pastor Mike? Are you, are you there? Yeah, and Pastor Sai. I mean, you guys went through a hard transition. Hard. When Pastor Njoro left and Pastor Wa. And pain. Where your associates tell you, you're not Pastor Njoro to your face. And people just are not interested in following you because you're not that guy. You're not that person. You know? And you went through so... I mean, by the way, the fact that you guys are here, you're just champions. Because you've been through stuff. Both of you, you've been through stuff that could break many leaders. There are many people who would have resigned if they were in your position, yeah? But why, why did you go through that? It, I don't think your people were evil. I think we didn't teach them the right thing. We didn't disciple them well. And so I confess, I didn't teach Pastor Njoro how to teach his people. So Pastor Njoro didn't teach them how to treat their leader. So when you came in, you were just eaten for lunch. And now you're just getting your head up again after a hard three-year transition, two, three-year transition. But you see, this, this stuff we're learning is the stuff if we knew would have changed some things. Um, Pastor Daniel, you, you guys went through some horrible times in Berlin. My guy, I don't even know how you survived. Um, if I was you, I'd have resigned. I'll be honest. I think you have a resilience that I don't even understand. Yeah? You do. And Pastor Boogie is here, he can testify. I mean, you guys told you things that people have no right telling anybody. And uh, some of you don't know, but some of what, some, he had a leadership crisis where some leader in the church just decided this, this isn't what we do. Uh, I'm not told by the pastor what I do. And anyway, who elected you to be our leader? And basically called a meeting to try and fire the pastor. In Mavuno. But you know what? Again, this is just, I think, Pastor Danny, you're understanding what I'm saying. You're from Germany, so I'm thinking you're probably processing this stuff and it's like, this is extreme stuff. But when we don't practice it, I guess we're seeing what's happening. When we have churches that are just everybody doing their thing. And for me, when I began to really think about loyalty, when I shared with you guys the book, uh, loyalty and so Apmo talked about the fact that when he began to discover some of this stuff, he started with book number one for his people. He was, he's that, he's, you guys have a very gentle bishop. He's such a good apostle. He started with book number one, book. I think for me, I just thought, Mavuno, we're just hardcore. We need loyalty and disloyalty. Day one. It's like, it's like we're so far in ICU, we can't be given pills. We need to be given oxygen. It's like, let's just breathe this thing and get, get to where God wants us to get to. Um, but I think we all understand. And all of you have had associates who you call for a meeting and it's just not working for them. Anybody feeling me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've had associates who are just like, uh, this weekend is just not good. Um, in fact, I don't know why you're telling me now. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, we're a great church, but we've had great issues. When I began to understand this stuff, I think, Apmo, you taught me something today that I did not know. I didn't know this. Because for me, the conclusion when I got to the place of loyalty, what landed me in this place of loyalty, was when I began to realize, and I shared this with my exec team, and I think I'll share a bit more. 
later. We began to talk about the fact that there are values that are fantastic for a church. They are incredibly important for a church. And then there are values that work for a movement. And those are two different things. And part of what we reached a conclusion, just independently with my, with my exec team, is we reached a conclusion and we said, we are doing some fantastic things that work well for a church, but part of the reason we're having problems at Mavuno is because those things are not for movement. Movement needs other things. And we began to realize that movement needs a certain level of alignment, and that alignment doesn't come from independent original thinkers. Uh, of which we are, of which I am one. We are all independent. No, we are all independent. On, come on. Yeah, let's just confess right now our sins. We are all independent uh, uh, thinkers. We, are, we think for ourselves. We analyze. In fact, we like those verses of Acts 4.13. The Bereans were of higher character. Because when Paul said, they went home to see whether the Bible was also saying, isn't that how we are at Mavuno? That's who we are. And I don't say that in any way to derog derogatory. That's who we are. And, but then we began to realize this is why we will never be a movement. We are, we are happily independent. <laughs> we'll always be happy running around and being a small a, a church. Maybe we can grow to be a big church, and we have grown to be a big church, but we'll never become a world-changing movement. And as an exec team, we began to repent and to say, this is hurting us. And we've been through a long journey with the team, uh, an intense, sometimes painful <laughs> I'm looking at them nodding because they know it. we're not, it wasn't, the tears we've cried are not those tears. You know those tears of, you know, have you guys cried those tears of? Like, nah. It was, the, <laughs> we've cried tears of, <sighs> like I've seen these guys cry tears. It's just been, and they've watched me, I'm the biggest crier by the way, I think you guys know that. Uh, they've watched me cry some serious tears uh, as we've walked through this journey. But, in the, but what Upmore taught me today, which I hadn't associated, for me I thought, we need to do discipleship, we need to be a movement. Followership has to do with movement. Discipleship is something different. I think what you taught me today is, a disciple is a follower. Like, it's not even about being a movement. Even if you're a church, if you don't have followership, you will be something different from what Jesus initially intended for his church. And I think that for me was such a light bulb moment. It was like, wow, discipleship is about following. And people want to follow. And many people come to follow us, but we don't teach them how to follow. And as a result, we create chaos in their lives. Um, one, of my, one of my pastors asked me, one of my executive asked me a question. I didn't have an answer for it at the time. In fact, I really scrambled and I struggled. And again, I think it's become clear to me what was going on there. The executive probably remember this conversation. This pastor asked, Pastor M, you and Pastor Carol are blessed financially. Like, God just seems to really bless you guys. And it's, we know you, so we know you're not stealing the money. But it's just somehow God has given you a knack for finances. And the person said, how come we're not getting that? I mean, it was such a hard question because it's like, how come... We are, we are in your team, but you guys just seem to be going, and somehow we are not getting it. It was such a profound question. I stumbled at first. In fact, I was a bit embarrassed by that question. Because it's almost like saying, how come you're rich and we're not? Yeah? But again, I really tapped into something there. And I think we, we did have a bit of conversation with it. But I think I began to tap into something there, um, where I began to realize that... <laughs> I receive because I follow. I receive because I follow. Um, and I can tell you that when you follow, I mean, it's, it's interesting because as I've read, uh, as I've listened to, like I said, Apmo and I talk every other week pretty much on, on Zoom, and we've done that through 2020. Uh, so I've been part of this revival happening at Worship Harvest from almost from inception and hearing the ridiculous stories and thinking, is this guy high? What is he telling me? This is not what he was telling me two weeks ago. Has, what has, you know, it's like his numbers just keep changing. And I'd be like, now, you told me two weeks ago that you guys are, uh, are, 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 are 6,000 people. He's like, no, no, no. That was two. <laughs> I, I, it, 
It's like his number just changes. At first I thought you were having evangelistic numbers. You know how evangelists always have bigger numbers because evangelists tend to be sanguines. But then I realized actually these guys measure their numbers. Did you notice that when the pastors were being told a year ago, how many were you? By the way, did you tremble at that point? Because me, I was like, if you ask me, I don't know how many we are a year ago. <laughs> so these guys actually count. They measure. Numbers are important to them. But it was interesting just to see that when you start to follow, something begins to shift. Something begins to change. And so I, I've been really struck. I mean, I, I, I did not even plan to have... In fact, here is how foolish I was and how ignorant. When I, did, I gave the book for us to read loyalty and disloyalty, I planned for us to have the conversation on loyalty on Friday after we've finished discipleship. Can you see how foolish I am? Because I didn't have any clue that these two things are related. I was like, now once we've thrashed out how discipleship is going to work at Mavuno, then now we can talk about loyalty and how it's important for a movement. Um, and I feel like for me, my biggest realization is you cannot have discipleship if you cannot have loyalty. If you don't teach your people loyalty, they will not be disciples. There will be something completely different. And so that's, so I'm grateful and I hope you guys had, anybody had a good conversation in your network? Who thinks their network had like the best conversation? Like, <laughs> yeah, 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 whatever. You guys are just competitive of nights. But I can tell you honestly, nobody had a conversation like ours at Lifeway. Like seriously, like seriously. So what we did is after we shared a, a few of our thoughts, we turned over to our guests and we said, why don't you guys just teach us something? You guys, we're in school for half an hour. Like people are like, what is tea? Tea, just shut up about tea. Let's listen to, we were receiving spiritual tea uh, from this amazing couple who just blessed us and poured into our lives. Um, so it was such a powerful time. I wish we could even, in fact, I almost thought, could you guys just come and teach instead of me? Like, like just those things that they taught us were just, was not a, is that true, Lifeway? Yeah, they, they taught us some just mind-blowing, insane stuff. Um, uh, secrets, it's their secrets. So watch the Lifeway team. That's kind of what I should say. Just watch the Lifeway team. In fact, even by the end of this week, you should see some differences. You'll be able to look and say, are you guys from Lifeway? You, there's some crazy thing happening we hear in the Lifeway team. But thank you so much uh, again for, for just gracing us. And thank you for the Worship Harvest team. You guys are such a blessing to us. You're such, such a blessing to us. You really are. So, um, let me ask a question, and maybe this question isn't uh, in any way to put you on the spot. How many have read my book, Fearless? Okay. About six people. Okay. So, the book, Fearless, is the story of Mavono Church. It's really your story. And it's really the story that talks about the heart of this vision and why this vision exists. And one of the things I write in one of the chapters is I write about the success of the past and then I talk about what God is speaking about in the future. Now, I wrote that book. I think the book was published last year, uh, beginning of last year. Uh, but I wrote it. I've been writing it maybe for the last three years. So I started writing it. So when it was finally in its final form, I think when, when Apmo first read it, uh, that was probably 2019, 20. 2019, beginning of 2019, around then. Um, and so a lot of the things, that I, was, I was actually reading it again. <laughs> so may I read my own books? <laughs> I was reading it again. And it was interesting because I talked about three things that I feel are crazy important for a new season. And I said, Mavuno has had an incredibly glorious past. And I said, the future is going to be very different. Not... Not that we're going to have a different vision. We'll have the same. The vision's the same. The mission remains relevant. But there's some new things we're going to have to do to become who God wants us to become. And even then, I'm not even sure I really completely understood it. I think I'm getting more and more clarity every day as we go forward. But it was interesting because um, I, the three things that I talked about that I said are going to shift in Mavuno. I said the first is we're going to have a, uh, God has just been convincing me, we're going to require a leadership shift. I just talked about a leadership shift. I said the vision that God is calling us to is so huge, it cannot rest on vocational pastors alone. 
At the time that I was writing this book, 100% of our staff were on payroll. In fact, full-time payroll of Mavuno Church. And I said, we cannot depend on, by vocation, on, on vocational pastors. Why? Yes, we'll always need vocational pastors. We'll always need some people who are able to give full-time to support the movement. But the thing God is calling us to is so big, we're going to have to raise leaders at a level we've never raised before. We're going to have to, need, we're going to, have to get people in the pews who are running businesses to come and run churches. So we're going to have to have, the churches will be led by people who are running businesses. And it was interesting because that was one of the first shifts that I felt God was calling us to. And I began to sense that in the next few years, 70% of our staff team will be bivocational. It's just, it was just, a, I don't even know where the number came from, but I just began to get that strong sense that we'll have a lot of bivocational pastors. Let me just ask, apart from the people who are interns and the people who are, uh, uh, yeah, so in the, in the leadership academy, uh, let me just ask you to stand, Mavuno people who are here, if you are not paid fully by the church, if you have a business or something else, you're, you're actually either part-time or not paid at all by the church. Just stand up wherever you are. You come to Mavuno, this is you. Yeah. By the way, stand, 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 stand. Yeah. Okay. Just stay standing. What percent do you guys think that is? Maybe 20, somebody's. Yeah? So already you can see something's shifting. Can you see the shift? This is from the last, this is 2019, two years. Already the shift is happening. In the next, by, the, by next year when I ask this question, more than half this room will stand. I want you to just watch that demonstration because God is doing that shift in us. And I want to bless you guys who are standing because what you're really doing is you're allowing... <laughs> You're allowing yourself to fund ministry. You're allowing yourself to be on the front line of ministry. You're leading congregations. You're leading vital areas of ministry. But you're doing that as you support. You're basically, your company, your business is supporting your ministry. You're like the Apostle Paul in that way. And we bless God. You're our future. Can we just appreciate them? We really bless God for you. Please have your seats. Now, like I said, there will always be a need for vocational pastors. But our role, for those of us in vocational pastors, our game has to go up. Isn't it? Because I can't be with a guy standing next to me and I'm doing the same work he's doing, but he is being paid elsewhere as well as serving here. Does that make sense? My job has to be so effective because I'm supporting five of, five of those or 10 of those or 15 of those. So I have to up my game. So that's, that's a leadership shift that is happening. And I just began to sense we're going to enter a place of leadership shift where we'll see some dramatic, dramatic things beginning to happen. George Hago, are you here? George Hago is our campus pastor in, uh, in, 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 in Mofuno, uh, Far East. We call it Far East. Uh, I don't know if it's Far East. When we start planting a church in, in Jerusalem or where is the, far, the real Far East, I, we'll have to, you'll have to change your name. Japan. I don't know what you'll be called at that point. <laughs> But, uh, but like you're leading a church now that's growing. It's, an, it's a very new congregation. How many people in it? So he's got 25 people. Let's just appreciate Pastor George. His church is a fast-growing network church. Please, please, please sit. So he's running that full-time. And in the meantime, he works full-time for a corporate uh, doing finance. Uh, is that, is that, uh, is, are you beginning to get the picture? Um, and I think our newest church plants are heading more and more in that direction. Pastor Martin, where are you? Uh, let's just stand. Pastor Martin from uh, Mombasa. Uh, this is probably our, la our latest uh, church. Uh, so great to have you here. And I know your wife is, uh, was not able to be with us because she's ill. Uh, but we know her heart is here as well. And we'll just keep praying for her even as we pray this morning. Uh, but again, he's starting. And you said something very powerful to me. You said, when I came on board, you thought you were starting a traditional church. And getting a venue, getting funds, and just starting. And you're saying today being here, and even just this whole season being here, is giving you the cry of your heart. Because this is something that you envisioned many years ago, and God is actually bringing it to pass. So God bless you, Pastor Martin. I'm so glad you're here. 
So I think this is this is kind of like something that is a shift that's going to happen. It's part of the shift that God is bringing. The second shift is a mind shift, a mind shift. And the shift is from church to movement. Uh, churches do things a certain way. Movements do things a certain way. Sometimes the things that make churches succeed are the things that make movements not succeed. If you are like me, you've traveled, uh, if you go somewhere like the U.S., uh, the famous churches of the U.S., give me a famous church, just shout out a church. Or a pastor, okay, Elevation Church, uh-huh. Transformation Church, Lakewood Church, Porterhouse Church, Bethel Church. None of those churches you've mentioned is a movement. Not even one. Why? Because the things that help churches become famous and succeed are not the things that help movements become famous and succeed. They're very different. And I remember going to the U.S. once. I think, I don't know whether we're with a pop or with a more. We've done, we've done a few trips with him. And I was in a conference. I don't think that one was with you. I, was, I, was, I think I was with my wife. And we were, we, were, we were listening to this guys talk about, at Exponential, they were talking about the fact that there are, there are practically no movements. Maybe there are like three or four real genuine church movements along the majority culture in the U.S. I mean, in the, in the minority among the Latinos, they're not sure. But here in the, in the top stream, there are none. And all your, all your great preachers the things they do cannot form a movement. And they talked about the fact that there's a guy and his name was Ralph Moore. And the guy who had, his church was multiplying like the blazes. I mean, they had planted over a thousand churches and they were still growing. And they said, come to this. He was doing a lab. First of all, they didn't ask him to do a plenary. So I was wondering, now we're here for church planting. Why aren't we asking him to speak? The guys who are speaking are those big guys with big names, but none of their churches are movement. And I said, why don't they give him the platform? Let this guy be the one to preach. So they had given him a workshop, a lab. So I, of course, I signed up for that. And I'm like, oh, that's the one I want to go for. I want to, hear the, I want to hear this guy's heart. You know, the first thing I, as soon as I started listening to him, about five minutes into it, I understood why they didn't give him the pulpit. I mean, seriously, the guy was not inspiring. He has no charisma. He speaks like a professor in a university. How many of you have heard of Ralph Moore and Hope Chapel? Pastor Daniel, yeah. Pastor Rocky. Three people in this room. How many of you have heard of Bishop T.D. Jakes? Yeah, my point. Now, this guy, I kept wondering, why? Like, how did this, like, why is this guy planting a thousand churches? In fact, when they asked him, uh, so Ralph, the guy I was introducing him, uh, I hear that you guys have a, a thousand churches right now. That's what your bio says. He says, actually, I think there, there are a thousand and forty because this last two weeks, about forty were planted. <laughs> like what? <laughs> like, like, in fact, he checked the SMS to say, I just got an SMS. They're actually a thousand and forty. Like, he speaks so like that. Then I began to realize something. And my wife calls it the curse of the gifted. You know, when you're very gifted, you want a pulpit. You have anointing. You want to be seen. You want to be big. You want everything to be around you. And I think that's a challenge in the U.S. church. The U.S. church is led by teachers. And they have pulpits. And the pulpit is a big pulpit. And the pulpit just needs bigger, to become bigger and bigger to be sustained. Ralph Moore, he's like, I'm an apostle. <laughs> so what do I do? I release people. He just teaches. He's not, a, he's, not a, he's not charismatic. He's a teacher. He just teaches people principles. And then he's okay sharing. He shares with other people glory. He shares the pulpit. He shares responsibility. Movements think differently from churches. And that's the thing I began to realize. My goodness. I need to be less of T.D. Jakes and more of Ralph Moore if I want to see. If you, if you see uh, Bishop Doug that uh, Pastor Moses is talking about, Bishop Doug is not a charismatic teacher. To be honest, seriously, you listen to him for two hours, that guy is not. Like he's put me to sleep a few times. He's, he repeats himself like 50 times in the same sermon. He does. But you know what? The results are there. May I listen to that? He's, the results are there. 
But you know what happens when you become one of those phenomenal preachers that everybody just follows because every word you say rhymes. At some point, why? Come on, come on, I can do it. But when I become that guy, why would anybody want to go to Pastor Njoro's church? Why would anybody want to go to Pastor Kevin's church? Because it, it becomes, it's like you're all channels to Pastor. Does that make sense? Now, a movement needs an apostle. I'm not trying to denigrate the role of an apostle. It does need leadership. And part of my challenge that God gave me last year when I told you that I wanted to quit is God told me, this is not your thing. And he said, you're sinning by doing that because it was never your calling, it was never your gift. And he says, a movement needs you more now than it did at the beginning. I'll, I'll tell you that story another time. But you know, it's so interesting that I realize movements think differently from churches. And I wrote that in the book, by the way, two years ago. I said, movements have multiple centers of growth. They don't have one center. They grow, they grow, they're growing. If you ask up, he'll tell you the growth in his, the growth in his movement is not even happening necessarily in the campus that he and Ari are in first. It's happening in the peripheries. And apostles are not threatened by that. In fact, they cheer. They celebrate because they are excited. That's how movements operate. If I see uh, Addis becoming the biggest church in the Mavuno movement, I celebrate. In fact, I want it to happen. I'm not threatened. Why? Because in a movement, there's no, the center is not where the apostle necessarily is. The center of, maybe the center of leadership is, but the center of growth, the center of God's Holy Spirit, the center of explosion, it's happening all over. That's what happens with a movement. Uh, the other thing that you find that happens in a movement is movements are measured by sending capacity, not sitting capacity. Now, when I look at uh, Worship Harvest, these guys are insane. Like right now, I don't even understand. When they tell you that they're... <laughs> Can you imagine telling your life group that you should bring one person a week to Christ as a life group. In Mavuno Church, what will you be told? COVID. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, you'll be told many things. And depending on how senior you are, if you're Pastor Njoro, they might tell you yes and not do it. Because Mavunites are also good at that. Huh? It's like, yeah, yeah, Pastor, yeah, yeah, we're with you. Can you imagine a church where the whole membership is bringing a person, to, every life group brings a person to Christ, and then these guys are able to tell you, every week now we're bringing how many people to Christ? 800 people per week. By the way, why are you guys hearing those stories? Because you know who you reminded me of? Or I re we reminded me of. In the early days, when Mavuno was really growing at Bellevue, and I'd go and speak in a conference, and they'd ask me, so tell us, give us numbers. I did this in Germany, um, I did this in the U.S. And I remember just sharing a few numbers. Yes, we were 1,600, and then the Lord came and fell on us, and we became 2,400 in one month. I would see people's eyes just glaze over. Chewy. And in fact, at one point in Germany, somebody told me, just don't share the numbers right now because it might lose people. I almost told Apmo, don't even tell us numbers first because we, we might get lost. Did anybody get lost with those numbers? Because they don't make sense, do they? It's like you are 4,000 and now you're 12,000 in less than a year and it's COVID. How does that happen? But that's what movements do. They're about growing and they don't grow in one space. They grow all over uh, the space. They're about multiplication and not addition. They celebrate. In a church, you're celebrating addition. Our movements always are celebrating multiplication. So that, that, the second shift for me was, uh, anybody with me? First shift is leadership shift. Second shift, mind shift. The third shift is a heart shift. This one is the hardest. Uh, if you read the book, you'll find that this is the one I struggled with the most. I really, really struggled with the heart shift. And I suspect this is part of why I was so discouraged. You know, a heart shift came from the understanding that systems don't disciple people. People disciple people. Mavuno is the king of systems. We are good in systems. We have systems. When somebody came up to me and told me, man, I just really feel my life with God is not going well. What, do I, what does Pastor M tell them? Have you done Mizizi? I mean, I have a system, I have a system for you. Uh, my marriage, you know, I don't understand what's going on with my marriage. We have issues. Uh -huh. I can see it's not just Pastor M who tells people those things. Have you done? Do we have a great program for you, isn't it? Because for us, it's almost like that thing of systems, disciple people, uh, 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 programs. We have great programs to disciple people. But what I began to realize is we have 
the, by the way, and the crazy thing is, we are known across the world as the discipleship church. Like we have a great reputation. Like people introduce me to teach this because of Mizizi, of course. I mean, like you said, Rooted is in thousands of churches across the world. Mizizi is in many, many churches. So I get introduced as a discipleship pastor. Have you ever felt a sense of imposter syndrome? Like, like I'm being called the discipleship pastor. I'm like, if only these guys knew. Because I began to realize that I had the systems for discipleship, but I didn't have the heart for discipleship. And when God began to show me how I use my time, how I locate my office space, my time, my week, I began to realize I don't allocate my week for people who I'm working with. I locate my week on strategy, on projects, on, on vision. Those are the things that excite me. It's not people's issues. It's not helping reproduce Christ in other people. It's not calling other people to follow me as I follow Christ. And I began to just be convicted. That was a hard, hard shift for me. Because I began to realize my team, who is the exec team, their relationship with me was a boss. It was a boss. Not as a father, not as, as a discipler. And their relationship with their people who are following them was the same. We had become a great corporate. We were better than, than <laughs> we're like a bank. <laughs> we have MDs and CEOs and whatever. And I began to realize that's what we are. And my heart was cut to the core. My heart was cut to the core. Guys, I was actually discouraged. I said, this is what my life work will be known for, that I started a corporate. And you know what happens in corporates? Politics. Oh, Pastor so-and-so did this to us. Oh, this guy's never talked to us. Oh, this compass. And then what happens when two execs are having issues? No, their teams start having issues with each other. Like I would see compass, you'd hear this compass doesn't talk with this compass. <laughs> I'm like, how does a campus not talk to another campus? Seriously. But that's what happens. It's like this campus, and you're like, they don't even know why, but it's like us, we just don't talk with those guys. We're suspicious of them. And it just became who we were. And I just said, Lord, is this it? This is what I'll be known for? People are introducing me across the world as a discipleship pastor, and in my heart, I'm like, that's what we're known for? And of course, I have all the theories. I can teach them what it looks like. But what it looks like on the ground is completely different. In Swahili, we have a saying for that. We say, if you took a ground, it's different. And I could see that what things are, things, if I, I was like, if only they could tell. If only, and of course, we do a good game. So when they come here for fearless, they, we, we, can, <laughs> we can impress. Mavuno, can we impress? Hoshi Pavest, are you impressed by us? We can do it. But we know how to impress. We know how to impress. But part of it is, I think when you don't have the real thing, you can start to really look good at the, th the thing that helps you feel. It's like you're, you're covering up your inadequacies. And God just began to convict me. Guys, I almost quit ministry. I was like, after 15 years, this is what it looks like. And then now we're talking about, let's go across the whole world and spread it. <laughs> so we go to Egypt where there are no, they have their own issues. Then we bring them other issues of campuses that don't talk with campuses. <laughs> I was like, Lord, I don't want to do this. I mean, I, I'm laughing about it now, but it was not funny. It was not funny. And we began a conversation with our exec team. And this conversation began, was it three years ago? When was that retreat we went to? Swar was it Swara? Where was that place? And it was 20, either 19 or 18. I can't remember. It's Tony Athi. It was which year, Pastor Mills? <laughs> There's always somebody on the team who knows everything. That's Pastor Milton. <laughs> By the way, that guy always remembers. <laughs> I think as an exec, we really appreciate him for that. Huh? 2018. Can you believe 2018? I sat down with my exec team, and that was a fast, hard conversation we had. And I told them, guys, it's not working. This thing is not working. And I say to them, I'm so tired that I'm ready to release you to start your own movement. And I say to Pastor Njaro, you take Hill City, start your own churches. Pastor Milton, take Mashariki, go do your thing. Pastor Angie, take South, run with it. Pastor K, I think it was, was Pastor Ke Kevin was there at that time. Huh? Pastor Kevin Derito, take Downtown Movement, start your thing. And I say to them, if this is what ministry will look like, I would rather we just be friends. And I said, Pastor Caro and I, we don't even run a church. We gave you all the churches. Take them. We don't even need a church. We'll go and farm. And they can tell you, it wasn't a joke. 
I was serious. And I said to them, we are not leaving this room until we make a decision where we're going. And that day I was ready for them to, do, to, to say, let's not, let's not work together. Somehow the Holy Spirit fell. In fact, it was so funny. <laughs> I remember that's the day we had some pastor, some exec trainees who are joining us for the first day of their, ex their first executive meeting. So we told, we told them, come at, come, come at lunch. I think they showed up. We told them, just sit in the restaurant until we're finished with the conversation. I think they joined us. Do you guys come in at night or something? I mean, it was like, we could, it was just a conversation where we're like, we're not leaving this room until we sort out. I think these guys must have thought, what, what have we been called into? Because uh, they came, I mean, we cried tears. We talked. We were real. People shared how they've hurt each other. And we just began to say, if we cannot be the best of friends, if we cannot be a family, we don't want to do ministry together. And that day, we made our first decision to be a family. I say our first because we've subsequently had to make several others. We made our first decision and we said we will work together. We didn't know what it even meant. But we said we're going to start working together. We're going to do different ministry differently. And I think we even shared that at the next um, retreat, staff retreat. Still, there was lots of teething issues. But we began a journey. And I feel like this year, kind of spurred on by some of the conversations we've had with uh, up, up more, reading a bit of uh, Doug Hayward Mills, uh, but also just the conviction about discipleship. We began a conversation with the exec team where we met every day. I think we began in March, eh? and we met every Wednesday, sorry. Uh, every Wednesday, we'd meet at 9 and meet all the way till 5. And unless there was something crazy happening that week, every Wednesday. And we'd come from a season where, by the way, we didn't meet last year. Because uh, last year, I just didn't have energy to convene them. I was tired. So I just called them back, and I said, guys, let's start meeting. And we started to meet, and we prayed, and we talked, and we read books together. And we started to open up our hearts. We started to share our stories, our deep stories. We started to expose our, where the heart came from. And the heart was not, many times the heart didn't even come from the room. It came long before. We came with our issues into the room. And now our issues are started colliding with each other. We started being open about those things. We started talking, getting excited again about what kind of church God was calling us to. We started getting a heart for discipleship. We began to change the terms of our relationship. One of the biggest things that came out of this conversation is from that time, from those meetings, I became their spiritual father. I wasn't before that. I was their boss. But our relationship shifted. By the way, it was a bit awkward at first. When somebody has been your boss and now they are your father, and some of them are my age. In fact, some of them are a bit older than me. I won't mention which ones. Uh, so, so it's like, how, how do you start calling this person your spiritual father? I mean, it's, it's awkward. But we began to realize this is the essence of discipleship, that there is a place where you follow me as I follow Christ. We began to include their families because it was like, I cannot disciple you if I don't have your heart, the heart of your wife and of your husband. So we began to include their spouses as well in the conversations. And oh my God, something changed. For the first time, I began to have joy in ministry again. Actually, by the way, I told the exec team, for me, the last time I felt like this about ministry was when we had Bellevue. Actually, even before Bellevue, when we had the club starting Mavuno. Like, I feel so excited about the vision. I feel excited about what God is going to do. I feel excited about the prospects about ahead of us. And I just feel like the devil is trembling. Every time that exec team meets nowadays, I feel like the devil trembles. I feel like God has answered our prayers when we've prayed for each other. I mean, things have happened that have just been crazy. There's, there's just a revolution that's going on there. And one of the things now that has shifted is I disciple them. I'm keen about their growth. I'm keen about their marriages. Caro and I, we look at their marriages and we say, let's talk. <laughs> we have conversations with them. They come to our house with, with their kids. And we have conversations about those things as well. Because, yeah, we want them to follow Christ. We want to shape Christ in them. So there's a shift that's happened. And I remember at the beginning of the year, we also began to talk about the fact, how can we begin to do this within our teams? And so I know many of them, and in fact, I think all of them, have gone back to their teams. And I suspect, by the way, there's a lot of joy within the staff teams in that are led by the exec team. I'm not seeing any heads nodding. Yeah, yeah. Pastor Kilonzi's team. Do they? Yeah, yeah. I sense, by the way, when those guys are together, there's something exciting that happens. When I, when I, when I, when I see them relating, I, can sense a, I, I sense a brotherhood or a sisterhood there that wasn't there before. When I see the Mashariki team, my goodness, those guys, they're just insane. Mashariki is just on fire, isn't it? There's something happening with their relationships. 
uh, I, I, I really sense it. I sense that the South guys love their church. Any South guys in the house? I'm now because your pastor has COVID, you guys can't talk. <laughs> I sense that they actually enjoy being together. Uh, am I, by the way, am I making this up? There's something that has shifted in those churches. I sense that the Hill City team, by the way, that there's a, a health that has not been there in a long time. Hill City, are you guys in the house? Our hosts. There's something that is going on. And by the way, I see them sitting up in a way they weren't sitting up before. I see people connected. Maze, the, I sense just like there's a revival at Crossroads. Like, like what? Crossroads, are you, is, am I testifying? The, there's a revival going on. I know Pastor Grace, since you left Crossroads, you left them at a very different church. Let me tell you, Pastor Grace, you need to start going back to those staff meetings. Like now they're even having people of other churches going to their staff meetings. Because there's such joy in their meeting. Pastor Ndachi, Emma, you've just been telling us stories. It's the truth. There's a joy that is happening there that just God is just releasing something uh, in that church. And there's something, there's something going on in Lifeway, by the way. Uh, I can tell you, when I hung out with those guys today, I just felt revived, like revitalized. It's just some, there's a joy. But I feel like this retreat is for us to start bringing all this together now. Guys, none of us was called to be in a nice church. Yeah? Your church, that, that campus you're in is not, it's just a, it's just a, it's a vehicle. It's a tool. It's a tool for discipleship. I think I've more told us that. And discipleship is where movement begins to happen. So this retreat is actually just to bring all these threads together. And for those of you who've been out of Kenya, maybe you're hearing some of this stuff, and part of the reason it might be even new to you is because with these kinds of things, change doesn't come from a pulpit announcement. It comes from demonstration. And one of the things that we just decided is let's start doing it ourselves in our spheres and hopefully as we do it, it will become the culture of Mavuno. Because what we realized is we had a great vision and a great mission, but we had a horrible culture. Our culture was not helping us get where we are going. So our culture is a culture of family. Our culture is a culture of love. Our culture is a culture where we love doing ministry together. Our culture is a culture of loyalty. We'll talk a bit about these things in detail. But it's, it's also a, a culture where we are keen about the one thing. We're that factory that is there. We're a disciple-making factory. We're not here to make nice campuses. We're not here to make nice jobs for people. We're here to make disciples. That's what this thing is about. And our desire is that every single person in this room will be the beginning of discipleship at Mavuno Church. That everything will flow from us. That's why I loved what Apmo said. There is no such thing as a technician uh, in this room. Because all of us are disciples first. Everything else is a sub-skill. There are no administrators in this room. Everything else, all those are just your side hustles. All of us, our main hustle is discipleship. So I want to challenge. I mean, I, I know that usually, because we're so good at fixing things, whenever I come to an event, a Mavuno event, there'll always be administrators who are running around doing lunch, doing all those nice things. By the way, I bless God for the administrators of Mavuno Church. In fact, I really appreciate the team, Pastor Godwin, Steve. Let's just give them a big hand. I love you guys. I appreciate you guys. But I, I don't want you to become Martha and miss Mary's blessing. I don't want you to be so busy waiting tables that you don't catch the anointing that is happening in this room. Because there's something that is happening in this retreat that will forever change Mavuno. And there's something that was said yesterday because we were hanging out with the Worship Harvest pastors and somebody said something. I can't remember who it was who said it, but he said, not everybody in Mavuno will get this. And they said the biblical ratio is 25%. What? I said, where do you get that? Tell me. I said, in this parable of the sower, a quarter of the seed fell on dry ground, rocky ground. A quarter of the seed fell on harsh ground and the worries of wealth and the deceitfulness of life grabbed that away. Another quarter was, it grew but it was choked by thorns. So it had the impression, it had good intentions but then problems came and caught it up. Only 25% gave 30, 60 and 100 fold. But guess what happens in the kingdom arithmetic? That 25%, because they're giving 60, 30, 100 fold, the eventual will be much more than if 100% caught it. Are you understanding? So here's what I want you to tell your neighbor. Please, tell, tell them for me, please be in that 25%.
it's so, so easy for Apmo to just be talking and for you just to be in a space where your hard, a hard heart is keeping you from understanding what is going on. You cannot let that be the case. Fight for your ministry. Tell your neighbor, fight for your ministry. Fight for your ministry. Guys, fight for your ministry. Don't be left behind. And I want to say this. There will be people who will not make this transition. There will. And I'm not saying that because I'm a prophet. By the way, I'm not even looking at you right now. If, if my eye is landing on you, it's not at it because I'm singling you. It's just because I have to look at someone. There have to be people who will be left behind. Why? Because that's how it happens. There are always some people who are caught up by the deceitfulness of wealth, which is now they're thinking about hustling, providing, how will this put things in my pocket? There are always those ones where the enemy comes and steals the seed even though they had good intentions. Yeah? There always are. But there's that 25% that makes a decision. Tell your neighbor, make a decision. You make a decision. You make a decision and you follow. You make a decision and you follow. And by the way, I'm like this. For me, I'm that guy. I don't need an empire. There's a kingdom to be built. I don't need one. If somebody here says, Pastor M, it's been real. <laughs> We've been buddies. I've loved it. Our lives have been blessed at Mavuno, but now it's time for us to strike out. I'll be like, okay. Yeah, bless you. And may your ministry even exceed mine, wherever God puts you. I will bless you. I will actually release you with blessing. And I'm, I'm not saying that in any way. By the way, honestly, if that is where you are, I will release you with blessing. I need you to know that. And I'll release you with love. And I'll give you a hug. <laughs> and we'll actually honor you for you've served. But this next season will need people who are fully committed, who will say, this is where God is calling me to go. So, so this is kind of what I'm talking about. Now, let me ask, uh, I, I want you, to, you guys to have lunch, and then we'll take photos. You guys are looking so nice, by the way. Huh? Everybody's looking really good. Uh, Pastor, um, anybody, who's in charge of the, is, is, is there a discipleship tree that's available for me to see uh, in the media? Uh, media room. If it's not there, I can do it another time. But if it's there, I'd be happy to, to share that. And don't stress, Pastor Kilons, if, if it's not ready. I'm happy because it would tell me the team decided to listen instead of work. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, it's there. All right. So, so basically, this became my discipleship tree. So, right now, um, there are six names on our discipleship tree. This is Pastor Caro and I's tree. And these are, these are our spiritual children. These are the people that we are pouring our lives into. These are the people we've given 100% access into our lives. We've given them meddling rights. These are the people whose marriages we want to flourish. We actually want every blessing that's in our marriage because, by the way, we have a very blessed marriage. <laughs> and I give glory to God for that. We want that blessing to flow strongly into their marriages. And we, spent, we, we want to pour and spend time into them. Now, it's, it, this is, we're st it's still information, by the way. This is actually a, a document that we are working with, with the exec team. So each of them is an exec pastor. Uh, pastor Kevin, uh, Edward and Yvette are campus pastors. The only reason at this point, uh, Pastor... Uh, Pastor Godwin and Noel are not here is because they actually fall in uh, the Kilonzi's tree. Like I say, some of these things will reorganize as we go. Um, each of them has a second gen. So these are the numbers of people that they are pouring into. Uh, and these are people that they have already said, I'm walking with you as a disciple. I want to shape Christ in you. So these are not numbers that they just said, okay, how many staff do I have? Let me put them here. How many, how many uh, people do, uh, are in our ministry team? No, 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 no. These are people who they know. They know their names. Uh, they know their issues or <laughs> they're getting to know their issues. And they're pouring into those people. Now, when you see the third generation, and the reason it's not complete is because we're still filling out. Uh, we're still in the process. This is actually a Google document I'm sharing with you. So we're in the process of filling it out. But you'll see the second generation, which are the numbers that these are discipling. So, those are people who are known. Again, we don't want to list, how many is your congregation? Let's put them there, no. These are people you've approached and you've said, listen, I want to disciple you. 
will you follow me? Because I want to help you become everything God wants you to be. And I will be your disciple. Now, when we're looking for disciples, what were we looking for? We're looking for faithful, available, teachable people. And what I told my exec team is, I don't want to disciple you if you don't want to be discipled by me. I don't want to be your spiritual father if that's not what you want. So you have to make a decision if you want to follow me. Um, so when you see names there, it's names of people who've said, yes, we're in this conversation. Now, it's slowly being filled out. Right now, to my utter shock, there's a thousand people in it. And it's not filled out yet. I mean, there's a lot of gaps in it. But I'm impressed because what I'm learning is there were people who were there that just wanted to be fathered. There were people who were there who just wanted somebody to show them direction, to, to say, follow me as I follow Christ. There were independent people out there who are not independent because they were born to be independent. They were independent because nobody had ever told them, please follow me and I will help you walk this direction. And so we're already beginning to see an alignment as, as is happening. And what happens with the team, the pastors, they have, uh, in addition to, could you click on Pastor Njoro's? Can I use yours, Pastor Njoro? Although it's, I can see it's not complete. Let me use uh, Pastor Angie's. Uh, take me to Pastor Angie. She's not here, but we can look at hers. It's on the, the tabs down there. I hope, I hope it's there. Is it there? And if it's not, it's okay. Pastor Kelonzi, sorry, I'm making you jog a lot. <laughs> So, um, just so you see what they're... Okay, so that's Pastor Angie's. So, these are her team. So, you can see there's some staff members, not all staff members, but you can see Jack and Jade. Uh, Jade is the one we prayed for and who lost her dad. Um, Des uh, and Janet, I've met Janet, she's here today. And then, she has two strategic team members. Again, not everybody on our strategy team is on this list. And then she has one of our elders, and then she has three campus pastors. And the three campus pastors are people who are in her network that she's inviting and saying, I want to walk with you. I actually want to walk with you. And this is my role. I actually want to pour into you as I'm being poured into. But again, for all these, they have to want to be followers. Isn't it? You cannot be led if you're not willing to follow. And so they have to be willing to say, yes, this I want to do. Now, Again, this is not a program. Are you understanding the difference between a program and discipleship? Because it's not a program. This is life. What we're saying is, hey, let's walk the journey. Let's learn together. Let's help you grow. I'm going to help you grow. And as I do that, you help the next person grow. And this is a vision God called us into when we became a movement that he's poured into our leader. And as I follow our leader, then I will pass on to you everything that I'm learning. And that's how it's going to work. So what we're saying is these, and like I said, I began to really sense God wants us to operate very different. This is a radical shift, Mavuno, from anything we've ever done. Because where we're going to see this leading us to is a place where we have no anonymous people on this tree. And by the way, if you, if you, if you were to see the, the rest of the document, there's another section of it where every one of those people, those numbers, <laughs> actually there it is. <laughs> so every one of the numbers, we fill out their email and their, their, their phone number. Why are we doing this? Because we're saying it's not, it's not an anonymous group. It's not just, he's in my life group, so I'm discipling him. No, 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 no. Who is he? Do I know this person? Am I invested in this person? Are they invested in me as their leader? Are we walking a journey towards discipleship? Now, is this a cultural thing? Uh, some of you are from different cultures. Uh, I don't know. Uganda is different from Kenya. Uh, Ethiopia is definitely different from Kenya uh, and from Uganda. Uh, Germany is really, really different. Um, uh, Zambia, I mean, that's, and, and Malawi, those are South and Africa. South and Africa is really different uh, from, so, so we're, we're, we're not, we, ha we have to be careful we're not doing a Kenyan thing, that we're doing a biblical thing. But part of what we're saying is, listen, this was not something that was created in a culture. This is something that was created by Jesus, where, and, and, by, and you see Paul applying it where he dis he's a follower of Jesus, and then he says to Timothy, the things you've seen me do, as was taught about in the morning, do to others, teach to others, bring up others, and they will do to others, and they will do to others as well. And our prayer is we'll get to a place where we've got 10, 15, 20 generations. Now, as you, because I know you watch the videos, because I asked you to, that, that were led by Apostle Mose and his team, Pastor Angie and the rest, 
you watch those videos in that training. By the way, they watch your videos before this retreat. And so none of this is new. Yeah? And as you notice, Pastor M, the great innovator, the one who always comes up with original ideas, the one who's fantastic at creating strategy out of thin air. Have you noticed there's nothing new here? I'm not, a, I have decided, there's a season that you just follow. You follow because there are results. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah, we follow. Mavuno, Mavuno, we are so good at it, we'll take it and we'll be like, let's just give some muchuzi mix. We, we put some spice and take it to the next level. But I'm like, why? Jesus didn't, wait. this guy just did what Jesus is doing and it's, hap- it's working for them. Always, oh, it's working for me. <laughs> it's working for them. It's working for them. Why do we want to take it and say, let's, con-? by the way, there's a word we use in Mavuno that we abuse. It's called contextualize. That word contextualize, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a disguise for independence and rebellion. I really believe it. It is. We contextualize ourselves into what we want. And we pretend that this is for my culture. It's actually because you don't want to do what you're being asked to do. You don't want to do that. So you're like, let me try something else. There's a great, psych- there's a great thing we learned from Mike Breen. He has a triangle. And I use that triangle as a very good thing. God is not against innovation, by the way. For all of you innovative Mavunites, God is not against innovation. But Mike Breen always talks about, remember the triangle? Information at the top, imitation, innovation. So when you hear it, fast, fast imitate it, work it, do it. Then when you, fast, when you start to figure out what are the, the roadblocks, then innovate it. The problem with us is we get information, then we run here. We want to innovate before we've even imitated. And that's not following. It's not discipleship. It's just creating empires. So I want to just conclude with those words and to say, guys, this is where God is taking us. And I'm, I'm, I'm really excited. I'm excited when I see Pastor Angie's tree because I know the people on that tree. And I can already tell something is happening in their lives. I mean, several of them are way older than Pastor Angie. Uh, one of the guys there is older than me. <laughs> and I'm way older than Pastor Angie. I mean, that's a crazy thing. I mean, it has nothing to do with age. But he has made, set his heart and said, I will follow. This is what God is calling us to do in this vision. I will follow. And I can already sense it. Uh, I can sense his attitude. He's one of our team leaders. Uh, in one, sorry, one of our elders. So I'm, when I sit with the elders, when I meet the national board and I meet with them, I can already tell there's a different attitude. Pastor Milton, am I right? You know who I'm talking about, isn't it? I mean, this guy, is, he leans forward. He's thinking different. Why? By the way, they're all bright, independent people. But he's one of the guys who got this thing very quickly. And he got it through Pastor Angie, where he's like, let me follow. He chose to follow. So I really want to just say this, these are the shifts then that God is leading us into. Let me just challenge you. Read the book, Fearless. Read the book, Fearless. Because it begins to tell you who God is calling us to be. Before you innovate, imitate. Understand what God is saying about this movement. Understand what God set out to do through this. And then let's just follow him. I, I love the fact that Apmo said, you know, it's, 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 I, I, I learned a lot of, uh, just by watching you. I feel like my own insecurity caused me not to tell people, guys, follow me. It's my insecurity. I'll be honest. Because, let me tell you why it was insecurity. Because I thought, what if I tell one boy to follow me and she says, I don't want to? I'll be hurt, (laughs) isn't it? I'm human. I'll be like, I'm so insecure. I like to be liked. Anybody in the house who's like me, like some sanguines in the house, we like to be liked. I like people to think. So I would give you just enough so that you have a choice and I have dignity. If you say you didn't didn't like me anyway, then I have B3, you're the (laughs) pastor B3. You know, it's like I'll create the fallback for when you reject me. Then I don't really uh, have. But you know, I've been watching The Chosen. Anybody who's watched The Chosen? By the way, if you've never watched The Chosen, even that one, take it as an assignment, just watch it. It's a real testimony of grace. It's, a, it's, it's on YouTube, it's free. And for if, if you have to binge watch something, at least binge watch The Chosen. Uh, and in, in The Chosen, I'm just being refreshed about how Jesus said, follow me. Like, I have a business. 
I've set up. I have a family. Follow me. That's what he did. Why? Because he knew who he was. He knew who had called him. He knew where God was calling him to. And here's the thing I really believe. I believe there is a grace, as, Pastor, as Apostle Mokisa told us, on this house. There is a grace on this house, guys. That grace has nothing to do with Pastor M. Nothing to do with Pastor Carol. It has nothing to do with us. There is a grace on this house. By God's grace, he's put us in a, in a, in a, in a role in this, just like he's put you in a role in this. But I want to say this, that there's something that will happen when all of us align to what God is doing in this house. And I'm talking about every single compass in this movement, every single location from Malawi, where we've struggled to grow. We've struggled to grow in, Latin, in, South, in South Africa. Is that true, Pastor Rocky? Yeah, we've struggled to grow in Lusaka. Because it's different. It's a different culture. Berlin, different culture. We struggle to grow. But I want to actually just say this. I believe as we align, something is about to happen in Mafuno Church that will shock all of us. And the largest campuses in the next two, three years will not be the largest campuses now. The fastest growth in the next two, three years will not be where the campuses are growing right now. Some of the pastors right now who are sitting on very small churches, you've labored for five years, for eight years, and you've struggled, you will be here and you'll be saying, I have no clue what happened. But right now I'm leading a mega church and it's growing and I have no clue what the Lord did. And it's simply because I aligned. Some of you who are interns, interns, you're doing Fearless Academy right now. You will be leading churches in the next two, three years that will be among the fastest growing in the Mavuno movement. Please write these things down. Write them down. Because sometimes the best way to test a prophecy is to see if it actually comes true. Write it down. Because if it doesn't, you'll tell me I'm a false prophet, right? But write it down because I believe this is the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. And so Apmo and your team, we honor you guys. Like I can't believe it. It's like you go to a hotel, you eat two good meals, and then you realize you still have three more days. Like I can't wait for tomorrow. And the day after that, because I feel like something is shifting. I feel like something's shifting in our hearts. You know, it's interesting. I'm a people watcher. And yesterday when Apmo was talking, I could just sense guys were like, I don't know, I just felt a softening today. I feel like people are leaning forward a different way. Am I, am I speaking for somebody here? Any of you, any people watchers in the back? Did you notice guys in the back were looking a little different today? Something is shifting. By the, third, by the last day, some of the guys at the back will be here dancing, raising hands. It's like something will have shifted for them. And, and I'm not even talking about they were resistant because all of us are different. Huh? Some of us are feelers. The feelers are already in front. The thinkers in the movement will be here because there's some of us who access through ideas and we think and we process and we have to go home and sleep over it. But I can see that God is just going to shift and break something. Uh, in this movement. And by the way, by the time we go back to our people, to our campuses, they'll be asking, what happened to you? Like they must have said at Pentecost when guys went back home, what happened? Where were you? What was that you guys were doing? Like what, what is this? Wives will be looking at husbands in shock. Like what, what happened? Like there's a difference. There's something different about how you guys are leading ministry. And it'll be because the Holy Spirit has done something in our hearts. I really believe that. So I want us to conclude and to pray for lunch. Um, yeah, have you noticed by the way Pastor M has no prepared notes for his messages nowadays I'm like Holy Spirit just lead us, just lead us Father I just want to thank you for this team I bless you Lord because there's something you are doing, there's something you're doing ah, Lord we've gone through pain in this movement and part of that pain was just needless pain we didn't have to go through but I thank you because you're a God who is so gracious. You do not treat us as our sins deserve. You accept every child who comes running back home and says, Father, forgive me. <laughs> and Lord, I lead this team. I say, forgive me. Forgive us. You've given us such a huge trust, such a huge calling. And Lord, we've not always been faithful because we've been so caught up on different things. But Lord, I just pray. For every single one here. Why not others you're calling? 
don't pass them by. Don't pass me by. Don't pass us by. I pray that, Lord, you would do something so radical in our hearts. Shift the atmosphere, Lord. And, Lord, I believe that even marriages in this team are about to change. Change completely. That people will not recognize them because of some of the things we're learning in this room. Lord, I just believe that ministry joy is about to flood into our hearts. There's a shift that's about to happen in our ministry. Some of us, ministry is painful. It's like I struggle to go to work. I struggle to think about my compass. And Lord, I just sense there's a shift that's coming. Something that will be so different because joy will be the characteristic of Mavuno Church. And Lord, that's what I'm looking forward to. I'm just looking forward to a joy that is beyond limits. People just loving each other. Loving being at work. Loving this family. Loving the results that they're seeing the Holy Spirit bring in their lives and around them. And so, Father, our hearts are open. <laughs> Feed us, Lord, through your Holy Spirit. I pray that even as we have conversations tonight, as we process what we learned, as we just continue uh, just sharing, Lord, allow us to be in that posture of expectation that you're going to do something new in our lives. We bless you, Lord. And we pray all these things in Jesus' mighty and matchless name and God's people say it. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a big shout. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord.